I like those wheels too. I want to see them in motion. That's right. Yeah, that would be pretty cool, you know, in direct sunlight. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're, they're actually proven to be uh, quite polarizing. There's people that either love them or there's people that, uh, you know, want to go for fewer spokes. And, they're pretty uh, similar to the concept, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean, they're, I have to remember, they're... Yeah, very similar to concept. I mean, it just seemed like from A pillar to C pillar was like the only thing that seemed to have changed, really, from the concept. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think every element of the concept has come through in the production vehicle. Yeah, I would say, you know, except for the, the cascading stairs. Yeah, the obvious, obvious bits of fantasy. Right. Yeah, yeah right. of course. <laughs> That's a good way to put it. What time did you leave yesterday morning? I left the hotel at 5, and my flight was at 7.30. I'm trying to remember now. And uh, landed in Detroit just before 5. How about you? I left at quarter to 5, and got in at 4. <laughs> It's funny, the, the, um, the woman who was, Kathy, who was saying, yeah, you know, right. the, um, or no, it was Pat, no, it was Kathy, Kathy. Um, that Roosevelt, his flight was at three, or no, his, his, his pickup was at three, yeah. and that he was gone before she got to the lobby. Wow. Because he showed up early and the car was there. And he, so, I mean, I mean, I'll blame him for leaving, but I mean. Well, why didn't you just take a red eye? I mean, at that yeah, point. You, you might as well, even like, ruined for, you're ruined for the next. I know. I hate red, I hate those, those oh, terrible. I'm morally opposed to red eyes. Oh, horrible. <laughs> I've taken one in my life. I, I swore I was never gonna take a red eye in my life, and I had to at one point. And that convinced me, yep, no, never do this. When I'm, I'm only physically opposed to them. My morals are not in any way. Uh, <laughs> my, my wife, when we had Smart. babies, she was like, oh, you will take the red eye. I'm like, oh, okay. <laughs> but I'm just warning you, I'm not going to be capable of doing anything. I'll be here. Yeah. But it doesn't mean I can do anything. Right. <laughs> then I have, she, now she's like, how about a red eye? I'm like, oh, that wasn't an option. <laughs> how about no? Yeah, <laughs> wasn't right. a, just couldn't do it. Sorry. Yeah, domestic red eyes, they're, uh, oh, they're rough. They're rough. Yeah, I always like that line. What part of no don't you understand? They're, they just don't make any sense. They, I, and you're, I mean, it is a real red eye when you land because you just don't sleep. Right. It's not, what, what are you in there for three hours or something? At least that's what it feels like. I can't stand. No. Or you get like you leave LAX at like eleven o'clock at night or midnight. That's just not my. See, I, I find one of the challenging things for them is the 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 time you're waiting to get on the airplane. I mean, so mm -hmm. so you're there and you're just like, I want to leave, you know, but it's not going to be for another hour or two, and you're just sitting there and it's just like. I'm getting tired, I want to leave, and... Mm -hmm. I always have these... And then you finally get on the airplane, and it's just like... Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I always have these grand intentions. Yeah, I'll just sit at the bar, I'll have a couple of beers, so I can take a quick nap on the airplane, and then I don't sleep, and then I get to land in Detroit, and then I feel like the worst hangover, even though I'm not hungover. It's mm -hmm. just... It never works. Keep telling myself yeah, 10, that. 10, 15 years ago when I first started traveling, it was all about you know having a few drinks. <laughs> yeah. And now, now it's all the I worst. want is water. Yeah. Yeah, water is right. yeah. all I want. Yep. Water and sleep. Yeah. <laughs> and a and, uh, little bit of peace, right? Because yeah. I actually, you know, if I'm going over to Europe, it gives me eight hours and I'm not getting pinged on my right. phone right. or... Mm -hmm. Or uh, having to respond to, you know, it's from family as well as from work, right? And so both of them are out of touch for eight hours. It's peaceful. Right. 
That's actually a better way to do it, a longer trip like that, longer flight. You know, I, I can usually get sleep. Yeah, yeah. I can never get enough. <laughs> enough sleep, yeah. right. No, I'm with you on that. See, but you power through. I don't, I don't buy that. <laughs> I, a couple, three hours of sleep. Oh, you mean when you go over to Europe? Yeah. yeah. Oh, no. To me, you take a nap, you're, you're no, toast. I take a nap. I'm good to go. Okay. As good to go as I can possibly be <laughs> under the circumstances, which ain't saying all that much. <laughs> I remember one time being over and, and you know, it was like one of these things you hit the ground running and, and it was in Italy and I was visiting, uh, getting a tour of a factory and uh, guys who give you tours of factories are always very proud of their factory. I mean, they're, mm -hmm. they're more proud of their factory than you probably are of this car. And, you know, so they, they, they just want to show you everything and, and, you know, and you know, God bless them for, for being so proud of what they do. and. I swear, I was so tired, so jet lagged. I was literally thinking about just lying on the floor yeah. and hoping he didn't notice that I was. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I've been on some real grinding trips. I remember one trip we took to Germany and they had a bunch of journalists. And we, we got off the plane, got on a bus, had a two hour drive, got into this building with this two hour long engineering presentation. They dim the lights. This is in the days of using slides. And when they turned the lights back on, everybody's head was on the table yeah. and they were out. Because of those fans and the, <laughs> right. the um, projector, it was right. just that nice white noise. You know, exactly. <laughs> I went to Japan for a two hour meeting once. <sighs> so I had not, my, yeah, I was really screwed up for that one. Mm -hmm. Still getting over it. It was, yeah, I wish. <laughs> I just blame that on three kids now. But. <laughs> oh, that was not good. That was not a bright idea. Wow. So we live, should I, should I tell the audience we're about to get started? Go ahead. Okay, we're about to get started. <laughs> hey, we got a great program here. We got Andrew Kernahan. He's the chief program engineer on the Lincoln Navigator. We got Dave Sullivan from Auto Pacific. And of course, Gary and I are here. Like, and we've got a car here. And we got a navigator in the studio. And we're going to get going right now. Watch AutoLine After Hours live at AutoLine.tv every Thursday at 3 p.m. Eastern Time. That's 12 p.m. Pacific. You can subscribe to this podcast for free by searching for AutoLine in iTunes, Stitcher, or YouTube. AutoLine After Hours is brought to you by Bridgestone Tires, your journey, our passion, and by Lear, a global leader in automotive seating and electrical systems. Hey, Gary. How are you, John? I'm doing pretty good, actually. Yeah. yeah. You too? Great. Great. You're lying through your teeth. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> What's wrong, Gary? Nothing. It'll be a great show because we got you. And Dave. that you that you're hearing right now is, is Dave Sullivan from Auto Pacific. Yes. It's thank great you for to having have you me. back on the show. Yes, thank you. For yet me. again. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Cool. And then what we've got to let everybody know is our special guest for today is Andrew Kernahan, the chief program engineer for the Lincoln Navigator. In fact, besides having Andrew, we got his baby here. We got the Navigator in the studio with us. Great having you, Andrew. Well, thank you for having me. Let's talk about this vehicle. I, all new, right? I mean, is there any carryover anything on this? this Probably the powertrain, right? Well, this vehicle is uh, new from the, from the ground up. Uh, even the powertrain is uh, new to the Navigator with the 450 horsepowers. Um, what the vehicle is all about, it's about the experience. And it's about how you uh, approach the vehicle, the design, the strong stance, the flowing lines that just taper towards the rear of the vehicle, as well as the, uh, you know, the, the Lincoln Embrace, which is becoming known uh, as a Lincoln signature piece of content with the lit star on the front of the vehicle, the sequential lights on the headlamps, the deploying running boards, the welcome mat, uh, the lit door handles as you uh, get into the vehicle. But it's all about the experience as you approach it and then as you drive away. Okay, how does an automotive guy engineer experience? Well, what we do is we think about how are you interacting with the product? 
and uh, we, we look at every step, every little individual step as you uh, go through the approach, the interaction with the vehicle, and analyze each one of those for uh, things that we can improve, things that uh, make you feel good, um, and then we, we really try to string them all together so that the whole experience, your interaction with the vehicle in its entirety, is a uh, positive one. How do you determine, as you just said, what makes you feel good? I mean, you, you, you can have zero to 60 times, you can have slalom times, you can have braking distances and a whole other engineering metrics. What's the engineering metric for making you feel good? I don't think there's really a, an engineering metric, but you can identify issues with the vehicle. So for example, if you had a bad shift or you know a light didn't come on at the right time or something didn't seem quite so natural or quite so such a personal or human uh, experience, um, then you're able to analyze that and work out how to fix it. How do you make it better? This, I mean, there's nothing, I mean, I've, I've heard all the presentations. I was in, in New York when it came out and um, I mean, there's nothing that quite has the same uh, amount of personalization that you can you can get with a navig this, this navigator. Um, in terms of when you were you know developing this vehicle, what what were the other vehicles that kind of struck you as you know like maybe a benchmark material or you know what were you kind of going for being like hey this uh, you know GLS uh, Mercedes Benz GLS does this we don't want to do that I mean what where did you kind of figure out how you wanted to position this vehicle? Well, we were. Um really focused on you know, the, the, the elements of how Lincoln has uh, been coming through over the last uh, three and a half, uh, four years with all of the new products. And really what we were trying to do is kind of just take it to the, the next level uh, with the, you know, the personalized content, the black label content, some of the feature content in the vehicle, such as uh, personal profiles. So when you uh, set up a personal profile attached to the key or attached to the button, you're setting up your preferences for not only the seat and the pedals and the mirrors, but also the climate settings, the audio settings, and then when you jump back into the vehicle, it's all there, ready and waiting for you. Now, you mentioned 450 horsepower twin turbo engine this has, right? Um, but you guys also reduced a lot of the mass. I mean, we look at this thing, it's a very imposing vehicle, very striking vehicle, but it isn't a ponderous vehicle. So can you tell us some of the things that you did to Reduce the reduce the overall weight of the vehicle. Well, um, so the upper body part of the vehicle, the the structure is uh, aluminum. Uh, so we took about 200 pounds out of the total weight of the vehicle. We actually could have taken a lot more out of the total weight of the vehicle, but we chose to reinvest some of that weight savings in extra content. For example, we've got the perfect position seats. Uh, what do you mean, perfect position seats? Well, those are the 30-way uh, seats that you've probably seen in, in the Lincoln Continental uh, with the individual thigh support, the uh, adjustable lumbar, or the, uh, the, the bolsters on the seat as well as the seat back. Uh, so we put that content in. A um, lot of uh, upgrades to the sound package, uh, which is adding a lot of extra weight to the vehicle. Um, so really focused, again, it comes back to the experience. We want the vehicle to be quiet and uh, you know, be a, a great uh, kind of haven where people are able to enjoy the journey with their, with their passengers. See those 30-way those adjustable seats, there's an engineering metric for you. That, yeah, uh, that, 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 is, that is comfort. That does make me feel good. Right? <laughs> okay, we got a question here from uh, Mac Murphy who sent in uh, via Twitter. He says, I love the whole vehicle, but not very good luck looking or luxurious in the exhaust area. Why no dual exhaust, something like Continental? I think as we were developing the vehicle, what we, we wanted to do is uh, actually go for the more subtle approach where we wanted to actually kind of hide the exhaust and have it, uh, you know, really kind of out of view and, or not be part of the, part of the uh, aesthetic of the vehicle. Is, is that tough to do? I mean, to, to position the exhaust pipes so that it is, is sort of behind the rear fascia? It, it's, we've done it on many other vehicles. It's uh, you know, really just to do with making the design and the calculations and looking at the variability and dealing with that. So mm -hmm. it's, it's very doable. Well, I was just thinking in terms of the heat and you know, like in melting in that area. I mean, that'd probably not be a good thing. You have to watch that very carefully. <laughs> yes. <laughs> There's some incredible complexity though, because I mean, this is assembled at uh, Kentucky truck. So you got navigator and you got those in you know, short wheelbase, long wheelbase, 
and Expedition, short wheelbase, long wheelbase. And then you have all of the aluminum super duties. I mean, um, is that, uh, you know, was, was, how long did it take to, you know, develop all of this and get everything going at the plant level? Because I don't, I don't know of any other place that has, can make that many combinations of aluminum, you know, in terms of the body shop. Um, you know, how long have you been working on that at the plant level? Um, you know, in terms of all this aluminum complexity at uh, Kentucky Truck? Well, the, the planning for the work at the plant started for basically at the same time that we started developing the vehicle. And we're in the midst of the, the work at the plant right now to be ready to introduce uh, the, the new vehicle into, into production. So does this vehicle get its own, basically its own body shop type of, uh, you know, its own assembly line in the body shop? Or is it shared with like an expedition? There's, uh, depending on the content, depending on... Uh, how it's uh, being built? Yeah, it's okay. uh, it's it's split, but it, it's you know based on getting the the most the vehicle the body down the down the line the most efficient way. So so we saw the concept of this vehicle. What was it two years ago in New York? Yes, two years two, ago. Two years ago, and then the production this year. Mm -hmm. So when did you guys start working on this? And you know how do you, how do you look at the the time frame in terms of is this a fast program, a regular program, a long program? Well, the, the early work probably started on the program probably about uh, three, three years ago. Um, but then as we, you know, get, get started and uh, really commit to what our design is going to look like, um, we were, uh, you know, working very closely with the studio on the concept uh, and making sure that the elements in the concept were going to flow through into the, uh, into the production version of the vehicle. Mm -hmm. um, so we were when we showed the concept, we, we knew where we were going. Mm -hmm. Two years ago or so, Lincoln did a refresh of the current Navigator that's on the road. Really didn't move the sales needle. I, I thought the vehicle was pretty good myself, but it, it really didn't move the sales needle. What did you try to set out to do with this vehicle that would really take it above the current generation? Well, again, I think it's coming back to the experience and really elevating the experiential nature of uh, driving the Navigator. You know, so if I go a little further with the, the approach, you climb into the vehicle, then you got that 450 horsepower, you press the button to start the engine, but it's just so quiet, you don't even know that the engine's running. You can continue your conversation with everybody in the second and the third row. You've got the, the luxury uh, touches uh, with the premium leathers, the premium woods, You've got uh, the stitching in all the right places on even the grab handles. Um, we've got our piano key shifter, which a lot of work went into defining how that operated uh, and to make that a real premium experience as you, uh, as you engage drive and start moving off down the road. Um, the other part of the experience is the second row and the third row, where you've, you've got uh, best leg room in the class uh, so you, and amenities in the second and third row with the connectivity, uh, with the uh, USB ports and power points. So even in the second and third row, you're able to uh, charge your devices. Oh, I, I have to applaud you because I, I, uh, I was worried when, you know, when I saw the concept, I thought, wow, this is, that's, that's big. I mean, it's a big change and it's pretty wild looking. And, but to see that this is not, you know, it does not, when you get in, there's nothing that looks like it's shared with the expedition. And I think that, to me, is uh, fantastic. I mean, the door panels, everything, the rear seat entertainment, everything is unique, and it, and that I think deserves a lot of praise because that's not true. You know, the way Link, Lincoln has been for a long time, it's always kind of been, you know, the, the 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 Ford with the fancier materials in it, and this is not anything like that. This is a different, totally right. different breed. So, well, yeah, it's, it's uh, designed and engineered to be a unique and compelling. Uh, proposition for the unique uh, Lincoln yeah. customer. But I mean, the, you know, different, you know, different powertrain and, mm -hmm. uh, you know, everything is just, it, it's, they, it's really well done. I haven't driven it, but I mean, it looks, it doesn't look like uh, it has a sibling of any type. So, and, and I think that's great. Now, now you mentioned in passing the piano key shifters and I mean, that literally, I, I, I got to go back to that. You know, it's, point it's, it literally is like piano keys. I mean, they're, they're, they're horizontally across the, the IP. So, I mean, what was the thinking behind that? I mean, because you guys had had stacked buttons before, and, and now this is very clever. Well, as we were developing the, the interior, we were really focused on the horizontal lines um, that you'll see throughout the interior. And that was about, 
know, there's, there's something calming about being able to look out at the horizon, and that's why we wanted to keep the horizontal lines. And one element of that is the horizontal uh, shifter, the, the PRND, uh, across the center of the IP. And we did a lot of uh, clinic work to define how that looked and how that felt. Uh, we looked at pianos. We looked at uh, we actually looked at guns on how their uh, how the triggers feel hmm. as we were developing the the curves for how each one of those buttons feels. And then we, as we developed it, we decided, okay, we've got to move it over to the over to the left, so it's closer to the the driver. And then we wanted to make the P a little bigger because that's probably the one that you hit the hit the most, right? As you're getting home, parking in your driveway, you want to be able to hit the P and exit the vehicle. And then uh, the ones that you perhaps use, or the one that you perhaps use the, the least is the N. So that's been made a little bit smaller. And then you've got the R and the D. So there's a lot of thought that went into how it looks and feels. I, I was going to say, could you talk a little bit about what, you know, I, I think part of the whole experience for vehicles when people say, oh, what should I buy? I said, whatever you end up buying, make sure you test drive it at night. Um, because I think, it, you know, it's a different experience for a vehicle at night. Um, Talk a little bit about what, you know, did you change any of the colors inside or, is there, or what's, what's the lighting like inside at night and what's the ambience in, inside at night a little bit? Well, some of the content on the interior, right, we've got the, we've got the big displays. We've got uh, a over, I think it's a 12-inch display for the cluster, uh, which has beautiful graphics and uh, subtle coloring that uh, dims during the night, as well as the 10-inch center stack display which uh, also you know, has uh, very uh, good quality graphics. Um, some of the other elements, we've got the ambient lighting. Uh, is it we've white? Got, uh, it's uh, the seven color is oh, wow. uh, available. Oh, yeah. okay. All right. um, we also have uh, lit seatbelt buckles, hmm. um, just as a, you know, an added little ambiance as you get into the vehicle. Again, it comes back to the experience. It's, hmm. I can find my buckle, I know where it is, and I pop the, pop the two together. Um, so it's very subtle on the in interior. You can dim it, and you, but everything is there for a purpose to enhance the experience. And you have some clever lighting. The exterior, uh, the, he the headlamps um, are rather unique. Well, we have on the, on the headlamps, we have the adaptive front lighting so that if you're in a residential street driving slowly, the light will spread further out to the side so you're able to see house numbers or see, you know, drives or whatever you need to, wherever you need to go. And then when you get onto a highway, it becomes a more forward-facing beam um, with, uh, you know, LED, full LED, uh, very, very functional, very effective lighting. Let's see, uh, Right Night 70 has something, a, a comment that I'm sure you're going to completely disagree with. He says, that baby needs a V8. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think with 450 horsepower, and uh, lots of torque coupled with the 10-speed transmission. Uh, you get all the, all the uh, power you need to be able to tow. We're going to have class-leading towing. We're going to be able to you know, stream down the, the road uh, effortlessly with the, with the power we've got. I knew you'd disagree with them. <laughs> <laughs> Armin says, was there any attempt to keep the side steps from the concept? And of course, you know he's referring to that New York concept, concept vehicle where the whole side of the vehicle would open up and this staircase would cascade down. Well, I, you know, if we go back to the concept, I think there were a couple of elements of fantasy, right? The uh, gullwing door, as well as the uh, three-step uh, deployable staircase that uh, was on that on that concept. Big river right there. Yeah. Um, what we have uh, on the production version is the is the single step, and it's really uh, you know a function of you know how many how many steps do you need to be able to get up into the vehicle. Uh, so we, we stuck with the one step. Yeah. Hey, Dave had mentioned, too, uh, two different wheelbases. Tell us your thinking in doing that. Well, we've got the short wheelbase, which is the one that we have in the studio today, and we also have the, the long wheelbase. Um, it, it is all about capability, and uh, with the long wheelbase, there's people that have that extra requirement to be able to carry extra, extra load in the rear of the vehicle. So it's a three-row, but you have behind the third-row seat additional space. Basically, for... all of the extra space has gone to the cargo area behind the third but row. But the, uh, the wheelbase is longer, though, yes, right? It's so, a, yeah. It's so, a, I mean, every bit the longer. rear door is longer, and the... Uh... Yep. I mean, it, it's a... Oh, wow. In you terms of complexity... to do it that way. Yeah, yeah in so terms... That's what, I was, that's what I was getting at, was that when I was talking about the complexity, because there is a, there's a lot of changes for this vehicle, and considering you mentioned, you know, the sales for the 
outgoing model, it's uh, it's a lot of money to spend for. Well, to keep the uh, proportions right on the vehicle, yeah, we felt that we needed to move the wheels back just a little bit and do the unique doors, but all of that extra space has gone to the rear of the vehicle. Good for you guys for spending the money and doing it right. I think that if you're going to make Lincoln what you really want to make it, that's the way to do it. How, how you know, are you going to ship both those models to China? Because that's a, obviously a very, you know, growing piece of your business. So the, the China market right now is uh, focused on the short wheelbase. Okay. Uh, so our intent right now is the short wheelbase. Do they get anything different than what we get uh, in terms of content or... You know, they're kind of a more of a rear seat focused uh, uh, buyer there, so. There is uh, really no unique content that goes to China, but what we have is, you know, we mix things a little differently for, okay. for the, the features and options and uh, how the series are offered in China. You, you talked about the different size doors on the different uh, wheelbases and all, and this ties into Cameron Sowers uh, wants to know, how did you design the vehicle with regard to egress, entry, usability, and the like? Because there's some real thinking that's gone into that. Well, on the, I'll probably use the second row as probably the best example of that. Um, traditional SUVs have a tip and tumble type uh, seat, which uh, frankly, it makes it a little difficult to get into the third row. So what we've got is a uh, stand up and move forward, so it's kind of stand and dive type seat that gives you a nice path into the third row. And the beauty of our design here is that you're actually able to keep a child seat attached to the seat without removing it. You probably want to remove the baby, but- uh, <laughs> No, you, you don't have to do that. <laughs> <laughs> but you can uh, remove, you, you can maintain the, the, uh, the seat in the, in the chair as you uh, get into the third row of the vehicle. So in your research, I mean, did you find that many people use the third row? The, the people that are buying this vehicle uh, want to have the capability to be able to carry all of their, or a good number of their possessions as they're uh, you know, try going about their business, but they also want to be able to carry people. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, we, we find that they do use the third row. Mm -hmm. And that's why we made sure that we had uh, first class seating in all three rows. Mm -hmm. We wanted to make sure that they're comfortable. They got power recline in the third row. Really. You know, it's sort of interesting, I mean, when you look at a lot of SUVs that have third rows, I mean, they're penalty boxes. I mean, let's face it, you don't want to sit back there under any circumstances. But, I mean, if you guys have power seats back there, that's a, an entirely different uh, proposition. Well, you know, we, we often, we, we kind of call the, the center of the, the third row the sixth or seventh bedroom in the house, right? <laughs> and uh, what we, you know, try, have tried to do is basically make sure that we've got all of the amenities and all of the comfort in the third row as well. So USB it's, it's, back there? I'm sorry? Is there a USB Yeah, back USBs there? in the okay. third row also. Hmm. Good that you're thinking of them. Bazio just wrote in to say, what's the towing capacity? Can a 30-foot Airstream be safely towed? Well, we're in the midst of doing our final testing before we can come out with what our towing numbers are, but we expect our towing to be uh, class leading within the segment. So within the segment, that's, the, the, those tend to be able to haul quite a bit of things. So yeah, my guess is the Airstream is probably on the list of things you can tow. Mm -hmm. So does, is this all wheel drive, uh, front drive, rear drive, all of the above? So it's available as uh, a four by two, which is rear wheel drive, and then a uh, four wheel drive uh, system. And that kind of brings me into the uh, drive modes that we have on the vehicle. So rather than providing different switches for different settings on the CCD, on the climate control or the uh, continuously controlled damping, or on the uh, two wheel drive, four wheel drive, all wheel drive. We have what we call anxiety modes or experiential modes. Wait, what? So, <laughs> so, when you, so for experiential, we've got the, the normal mode, which is okay. just driving down the road that you might want to on a, you know, every day. Then we have excite, which is a little more aggressive, uh, where you've got, you change the pedal mapping, you put it into four wheel drive, uh, it changes the CCD to um, a, a harder setting, a more sporty setting. And then you've got um, the conserve mode, which perhaps bias, biases it a little bit more towards um, fuel economy. And then on the anxiety side, 
We've got uh, slow climb, if you're climbing up a mountain or climbing up a, a rock, rock face to the campsite, and that uh, changes the settings again. And then additionally, we've got uh, sand and gravel and uh, the, the mode for when you're on loose surfaces. So all of those change the suspension settings? Yeah, the then. settings and, yeah. The, and the drive mode. So is the four-wheel four drive versus two-wheel drive. Shifting, does it change the shift um, schedule or yes. in, in throttle mapping? In throttle well? mapping, yeah. Um, the Lincoln's been pretty big in having the active noise cancellation. Uh, does this also have? Yeah, we've got uh, okay. ANC across the, across the vehicle line. Okay. And is that also linked to um, the excite modes and the? There are, there are some subtle changes. Okay. Very interesting. So the uh, noise cancellation is used for better articulation between the different rows, people being able to speak to each other? Or are you actually changing the sound of the interior of the cabin or? Well, it's really doing two things. It's uh, an opposing wave to any sound that's in the cabin. So that uh, is, and that comes through the, the speakers in the, in the doors, and that uh, lowers the overall ambient noise within the vehicle. It helps with uh, articulation index, so you're able to more easily hear what's being said in the third row, in the front row. Um, so it, it does contribute to that. And then we also do, in Excite mode, uh, have uh, sound enhancement as well, which is a little bit, uh, you know, if giving a little extra sound that people want to hear inside the vehicle. I.e. engine noise. I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. so you hear the engine or the exhaust more. Yeah. yeah. So when you were doing the development program, I mean, did, did something come along and, and surprise you in a delightful way that you're like, damn, this is, this is really nicely done? I think the piece of the vehicle that uh, surprised me the most as we were developing it and the potential that it has is actually the uh, family entertainment system. So that's optional on the vehicle, but uh, it, it streams from your phone. So if you have a phone or a movie on your, on your Android or Apple device, you're able to stream it up to the video, up to the video screen. Um, you're uh, also able to use a sling box. So when you have a sling box in your home, you're able to connect via the modem and be able to watch your cable shows, whatever you have on your home TV, on the vehicle. Well, and, and it looks gorgeous. The whole system looks gorgeous. I mean, it doesn't look like, oh yeah, we need to put a screen in. And you know, it doesn't have that aftermarket look. I mean, it's, it's a beautiful setup. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm shocked because I wasn't a big fan of the one in the, the way the new Expedition looked, but this is, this is a pretty amazing look. Well, I think it's a, I think it's a 12 inch screen, high definition, and you, you watching a movie on that, you can watch it with uh, headphones, or you can actually hook it up to the 20 speaker Revel audio system and have the sound coming through that system as well. That's pretty good. SubGR says, he, he heard you talking about the, the engine uh, numbers, torque and horsepower. He says, when does the torque come in? That makes a huge difference. Uh, well, the torque curve uh, really has it coming in from the moment you start you know, pushing into the, into the accelerator, uh, the torque is uh, climbing right away. And uh, you've got all of, the, all of the power and torque you need right from the very beginning. At, at a very low RPM. Very low RPM. Is yeah. the torque curve the, like the same as the Raptor then? Or is it different? Uh... Well, you know, like, like I said about the towing, we're still kind of finalizing yeah, exactly okay. what our uh, curves look like. Yeah, it's very, uh, it's, they're pretty similar there's basically the same powertrain, right? Tuned for the different applications uh, to you know, make sure that we're delivering the experience. Okay. You have a 10-speed transmission. I mean, was, is, is, is 10 have some particular goodness for this car, or is it just like 10's the number everyone has to have now? I think uh, you know, the 10-speed the uh, you know, really delivers what we, what we need. It gives you that smooth, uh, transmission of power it enables you to be able to do all the, the towing, uh, be, enables you to be able to be, go up the mountains on the you know, difficult roads. Uh -huh. um, I don't think there's any magic about 10. Uh, it was the, the transmission that uh, matched most effectively with what we were trying to do with this vehicle. Mm -hmm. When will it be ready to to be out in the showrooms. You, you, you talked about uh, everything that you're doing at the plant right now, all the complexity and all the planning that went into it. When does it hit the road? 
uh, we expect to be uh, delivering this to dealers uh, probably fourth quarter of this year, so within the next few months. So what's got more aluminum, this or the F-150? Well, simply based on the size of the body. Um, <laughs> it's got to be this the, one, yeah. We probably have more aluminum than the, the F-series. Yeah. Yeah. Is the frame on this one different than the, the outgoing? Or was it, you know, is there any weight loss in, in the frame? So we, we have made some changes to the frame, uh, some upgrades. It's high-strength steel, uh, but it, it's, you know, tuned for the, for the all-new all new okay. vehicle. And independent rear suspension. Yep, on this, we've correct? maintained that. And that's yeah. mainly for the more comfort in the third row, isn't well, it? Well, it enables you to have a better package for the for the third row occupants, but it also gives the you ride the ride is it gives you the, yeah. the ride yeah. uh, improvements uh, as well as noise improvements. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, I think even the, the outgoing model, which is fairly dated, I mean, rides better than a new Escalade. You know, in, you know, in terms of the because Escalade know, does not have an independent rear. Right. No. They save a lot of money that way, yeah. but I'll bet you the next version goes independent rear because this is going to be pretty competitive with the Escalade. Well, good. With that, I think we're going to wrap this up, but Andrew, thanks so much for coming by today uh, and especially for having a navigator in the studio with us. It's, it's really good. I can't wait to drive it. I, I'm, I'm almost disappointed it's not until the fourth quarter that it's coming out. You know, I'm, I'm dying to see how this drives, but once again, thanks so much for coming on After Hours. Great. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Appreciate it. Real good. We're going to take a, a quick break right now, and we're going to give a shout out to our friends at Bridgestone. Okay, we're back. You haven't driven this thing yet, have you, Dave? No. You, no. Gary, you haven't been in the Navy. No, I haven't. So I wish. It, yeah. it, it, is, it is surprising to me how closely it resembles what we saw two years oh, ago. Yeah. I mean, it is... Um, it, when I saw it, especially in this color that's here in the studio, right? You know, and to see that, and I'm like, it looks the same. But I mean, you know, if the doors closed, it really did look very, very similar to the concept. And, so. and the way they they kept those the propeller, wheels, propeller every, wheels, yeah, yeah that that's. Uh, but I mean, the good. lighting and everything. It wasn't, you know, concept. You can kind of go a little crazy, and mm -hmm. yeah, didn't they didn't sway too far from uh, concept, but. Yeah. You know, compared to the outgoing model, which was... And I, th I think it's very propitious timing for them in the market to be able to come out with something like this now. I mean, they probably wish they'd had it before, but, you know, having it now is not going to be a, uh, a problem for them. No, in any way, and shape, it, or form. Uh, it def okay. definitely stands out, though. It so. is time at oh. the show for Dr. Data. All right, so this is a simple one. We won't have any graphic on this. The, the number, one number, 1540. What could 1540 be? Now, I'll give you a hint. It has something to do with the company we were just with. Okay, Gary and I just spent a bunch of time with Toyota driving the new Camry. And uh, 1540. What? Mm. It's got something to do with Toyota. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, I'm going to guess the number of... Prius Primes they sold last month. What's your guess? Um, wow, you have to come. I, 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 you got no idea. No idea it's, on that it's, one. It's, I, I can only. And, and this sort of came to make an educated because, guess. John and I were talking to the uh, the guy who is in charge of the uh, Entune 3.0 system, and he was talking about why Toyota developed these things. Well, it turns out that that is the number of U.S. patents that Toyota got last year, which makes like Entune? them. No, no, no. Oh, Overall, okay. Toyota patents, U.S. patents. See, that's going to be quite the audience. 1540, um, which puts them in the top 20, the only automaker. Of everybody who, ever, who filed for patents last year in, in the US, United States. Right. Hmm. And so, not, not just automotive, anything. Well, yeah. They, so, so they're in the top 20 with Apple and Google and Microsoft and IBM. And, and so, yeah. But so three years running, they've had more U.S. patents than any other here automaker. I was thinking you were going to throw me like some Camry towing number yeah. or something, you know. Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, because, we, you know, we, we heard that, you know, what their strategy is in terms of making sure that they have the technology that is suited to their vehicles and, you know, not buying this third-party stuff. And yeah, I, I, it in their we vehicles. should ask Dave about that, you know, because Toyota does not have... Apple CarPlay or Android Auto in its cars. I don't think Ford does either. Ford does, yes. Oh, they do? Yes, okay. Yeah. But it, so 
you know, what Toyota was telling us is, you know, we want to make sure that apps are safe and we don't, I'm guessing they don't want Google and Apple getting all the data. Yeah, I think, uh, they're, you know, it seems like the Japanese brands are the last to uh, make their way. I mean, Honda was the first, right. uh, I believe, and Nissan has two with Apple CarPlay and that's it. Um, but, you know, Subaru, no. Um, and then uh, in terms of Toyota, they've already said no. We're not really. We don't really have any interest. Uh, this Intune 3.0 is the way to go. I mean, yeah, there, there's a lot of data, but I mean, uh, in terms of you know looking at some of the past support that they've had for their infotainment after it's three, two, three, four years old, um, it hasn't been there. So I don't have a really uh, warm, fuzzy feeling that uh, you know. That this the new Camry uh, in you know 2021 the infotainment isn't going to feel old. I mean, I can plug in my phone no matter what in any car, and I can have full functionality. And uh, you know, even next year, it's not going to feel dated because it's still it's, a, it's my phone. So I don't know. I, I I know what they're thinking, and Ford kind of had the same idea, and then they gave in. But Toyota seems to be standing their ground on this one, and I I. Hate to say they're, they're addressing that. the datedness. I don't know if we can talk about it, but that's yeah. Taken care I, of. I I I just have a. I'd rather just use my phone. It was an interesting thing though. I read a statistic today that that one of the reasons why there are most, more apps being developed for um, iOS rather than for Android is because most users of the Apple system upgrade all the time and there's like the, that's a very small percentage of people who have Android phones up update their uh, their OS. What? Okay, so if I'm a developer, right? So I want to have it for the latest platform, all right? Yeah, so, but so you're, that whoever wrote that, you probably read that on some Mac website or something. <laughs> no, so, no, no, no. <laughs> yeah, because they, they don't understand how Android works. It's all updated actually in the background through Google Play services. So over 90% of phones are all running on the same Back and same software in the back doesn't. It's not OS dependent. Or, you know the number. Check so, this, Dave. I'm not. Making please let me know. I'm not. Guy. I'm not either. <laughs> okay, Gary. What else do you think we should be talking about for news of the week? Well, I think a surprising thing. Uh, the Takahiro Hachigo, the uh, president and CEO of Honda Motor, um, made a presentation yesterday in Japan talking about their vision going to 2030, and saying that uh, they're going to go to level four in uh, 2025 for autonomous driving. What I didn't see mentioned was Waymo. In where? With Honda. Because oh, they've got a deal with them? They've got a deal with them. So either a deal is dead because it didn't mention it or it's not finalized yet. I don't know which one, but I mean, that was six months ago that they had mentioned that. Why is Honda so far behind? Because I mean, talking 2025, Are, yeah, I, I think mean, so. Is it? 2025 isn't that far away. I yeah. mean, well, they're you know, going to do level three by 2020. Yes. Yeah, but level. Th everybody keep of, saying. I think everybody's level, skipping level three, but I think they should. Um, but I mean, are they far behind? I mean, at, you know, their life cycles at Honda tend to last six, seven years. So this kind of puts them at, you know, the Odyssey that's coming out now, or the Accord that will be out in a few months. I mean, six, seven years from now, they'll be next the next cars. Uh, that timing, so it's not really that far away. I mean, it sounds that far away, now, but it's not in terms of auto world. It's not that far away, and no, I mean, I there's not really any demand. I mean, it, it, who it, knows? Why would they want to be first? They could be the first with like, and they could, it could have tons of problems, and they could be the the one who takes the you know falls on their sword uh, if it uh, if it doesn't work. So, uh, just seems to me that. Uh, They've missed this whole move to mobility and sort of poo pooed it and now realize we better jump on the bandwagon. We're going to get left behind. I mean, well, I mean, we don't know. I mean, if they're talking to Waymo, uh, if they still are, I don't know. Um, you know, they, they, may have, they may be working on something. We're just not going to find out about it. But would, wouldn't that sort of, if, if they're talking to Waymo and Waymo's got that thing working with FCA right now, um, I mean. So, as Sergio Marchioni said, though, they are just. They're a customer of them, of, of FCAs. They're not necessarily working with them in terms of development. It's just a, you know, they're helping them with like, you know, CAN bus and that kind of thing, but they're not, you know, using them. So you think way. the thing with Honda and Waymo is 
the engineers oh, I, are working I mean, they've working, had job postings. And, and, yeah, and, uh, I mean, they've had job postings at Waymo for, you know, people that speak Japanese to help with customers. <laughs> so, yeah, I, I think it's uh, moving along. So I, 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 I'm, they might be behind, but they may get the best one that's out there right now. Could be. And Waymo's definitely ahead of everyone else. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and on this whole thing of autonomy, um, Delphi made another announcement uh, working with this uh, French mobility company, Transdev. And Transdev right now has autonomous vehicles running around. They look like uh, the, the uh, Ollie of uh, local motors. It's, a, you know, those, those little cute little, little yeah, lozenge like, buses sorts of things. And, uh, and, and you know, they're going to they're gonna work with this company and, and put in the system that they're developing. And, uh, you know, they're going to start running, um, you know, on demand. You know, you call it up on your phone and this thing can come get you and takes you somewhere in, in limited regions. And you know, I, I mean, I, just to kind of backtrack a little bit, but, I mean, we're, you know, you talk about being behind. I mean, we still don't have automated trains. We don't have automated, you know, ships. We don't, you know. I mean, trains run on a track in like a, you could basically say it's like a geofenced type of situation, and we still don't have automated trains. I mean, that's kind of the... Yeah, it's but it's not because of the, the lack of technology. I think it's just the perception that like, people well, wouldn't so trust I, it. Yeah, so what you, would, you would, would you trust an automated train or an automated car? I do one at the airport all the time. There's well, nobody that one driving would, it. No, that, yeah, <clears throat> back and forth, but I'm getting at it is like... Disney. <laughs> <laughs> yes, but I'm, you know, hop on an Amtrak that to uh, Chicago, why can't, why do I need a driver on there? Boeing's going to start experimenting with an autonomous airplane next year. Well, so I'm, I'm, a this is a, a passenger plane? Yeah. But you know what I'm, I mean, well, I mean, I mean experimenting, mean, probably not with passengers on it. Oh, well. But you kind of understand what I'm getting at is that, that it's not, I don't know if I would say in, they're necessarily behind. It's just, there's, I look at other opportunities where it may be easier to implement something like on a train because you have controlled you know, everything can be yeah. controlled. You know, when you're driving a car around it, you have a squirrel run out or, a, you know, whatever it may well, be. Here, here's the other thing with Honda. You know, they sort of poo-pooed electric cars. Toyota, too, for that mm -hmm. matter. You know, they, they put all their belief in, in hybrids and, and fuel cells. And then they spun on a dime and started an EV program. And I, I see the same sort of thing happening with AVs automated uh, vehicles or autonomous vehicles that, nah, we don't have to go there, spin on a dime, and now we got a program going. Yeah, I mean, uh, I think that's one of the benefits of Waymo is that they have a, you know, they're the fallback. You don't, you, you don't want to do it internally. Mm -hmm. you, know, you know what? You can buy it from us. But uh, in terms of the EVs and other things that, you know, well, Toyota's going to be doing an EV. Why? Chinese market. Well, and... and and to your point, and to your point, um, in his presentation yesterday, he said, as for zero emission vehicles, we will strengthen the development of electric vehicles in addition to fuel cell vehicles, in addition to a China exclusive model scheduled to go on sale in 2018. A dedicated EV model for other regions are also currently under development. We will introduce this model at an auto show this fall. So. One for China in 2018. Have to. One for the rest of the world. Uh, in October of last year, we developed within Honda R&D an electric vehicle development division, a specialized team which will be in charge of developing the entire vehicle, including the powertrain and body. So, I mean, here they are, spinning on a dime and throwing in the resources. Yeah. In well, a very I mean, big way. It's got to be. I hope it's better than the Clarity EV with 80 <laughs> miles of range. I really like the Clarity fuel cell, but mm -hmm. that EV. Mm -hmm. I think the plug-in's probably the sweet spot of that. Hey, we've got more, more topics to get into, but this is probably a good point to take another very quick break right, right now. We've got to give a shout-out to our friends at Lear. Lear Connexus offers a parental controls application with geofencing that sends notifications regarding driving behavior and location, including curfew alerts, acceleration alerts, and speed alerts. All delivered to a smartphone application that includes vehicle location, driver notifications, and a report card of driving history, including notifications when predefined geographic boundaries are crossed. For more information, visit Lear.com. Really handy when your car is at the dealership. But what, what comes in handy, that Lear stuff? Oh, yeah, that uh, those come in real handy when you can see what they're doing with your car at the dealership. Oh, monitor the dealer with that. Yeah. <laughs> yep, as I found out last week. <laughs> oh, very interesting. I had one set for 78 miles an hour, and all of a sudden I get an alert. <laughs> <I'm> like, <laughs> what the heck is going on over there? Anyway. Oh, 
So speaking of China in electric vehicles, uh, Jerry Brown, the governor of California, the sixth biggest economy in the world, um, he, th there was a quote that came out in a news release that I found to be breathtaking. It's quoting Jerry Brown now. In order to achieve California's climate goals, we need more electric cars and more hydrogen fuel cell cars that are charged with renewable energy. We welcome any Chinese technology that will help us achieve these goals. We have a very tall hill to climb and we want to introduce clean technologies as quickly as possible. We need a great leap forward. Great leap forward, of course, <laughs> referencing- one of Miles things. Exactly, but I mean, you know, so, so here he is in, you know, in China right now saying, damn it, and, and he talked to a variety of uh, vehicle manufacturers, uh, BYD, Beijing Auto Group, Great Wall, Geely, Dongfeng, and, and so on, and saying to these guys, bring it. And uh, um, so California and the Chinese are gonna begin to work together on developing the demand for more EVs. So politics aside, is this going to kickstart EV sales, meaning are we going to get scale to drive the price down? Uh, I don't, you know, no, probably not. I mean, the only thing that's going to come down will be the battery prices. But if you're limited to California in terms of like incentives or whatever it may take to drive, you know, the demand. But I think what he's hoping for is you're watching the Chinese market grow. EVs have well, they were expanding at a very rapid rate in China. They're not, they've slowed down a bit um, there now, but. Because those were not retail sales yeah, those were, last year yeah, anyway, yeah. largely. They were the governments and the agencies and everybody bowing to what the government mandate was. But I think that, I think California is growing impatient with, you know, what's going on in the U.S. I mean, still EVs are, you know, 1% or under of uh, sales. So they're looking at, hey, China, you know, we know you have a lot of volume. They're basically, their sales there for all vehicles are double what they are here in the U.S. You know, they have the, they have the option, the ability to kind of feed off of uh, the volume. And as volume grows, the prices come down. And, you know, they can hope that uh, get more EVs on the road and from, from China. But, I mean, look at like Coda. You know, that was originally a, a you know, Chinese, uh, sort of a Chinese car. And, and uh, um, you know, Karma is another one that's in, in California and they're, you know, Chinese money. Um, so who knows what's, you know, how, how real he is. And, you know, if he's, when he's gone, what's gonna happen too, so. You know, you, Gary, you said put, you know, politics aside. I don't think you can put politics no. aside in this. I, I think this is an astute move by Jerry Brown. Number one, to, to counteract what Trump just did of pulling the U.S. out of the Paris Accord and saying, hey, we're going to China. And boy, now you're gonna see all the, the manufacturers based in the US go, whoa, 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 what do you mean you're going to China? And start getting real interested. At the same time, we know China is investing massively outside of its own country. It's putting a lot of money in the United States. Jerry Brown clearly wants them to put most of that money in California. To, so to say, hey, China, we open you, we yeah, welcome you with high open arms. jobs and, um you know, there's a lot of potential for, um, you know, development. Right. Um, I, I can't remember the name of the uh, N NIO. Oh, yeah. Neo, Neo of the, yeah. I mean, that's yeah. another one. They just keep, they just keep popping up. The former Saab. Yeah. yeah. The electric. Yeah, super uh -huh. high performance electric, electric car. But you know, the thing is, uh, y you can welcome all these companies to come to California, even if they go to the 13 other states that have climbed on board with California's regulations. Can you really make money at it? It's one thing when the Chinese government is giving you all kinds of incentives to buy factories and to consumers to buy these things. Can you really make it work in the US? I, we'll have to see. I, I, I'd be very cautious if I was a Chinese EV maker or an investor trying to determine if, if this was a smart move. No, I, I mean, I, I, you look at, I mean, I know people that buy EVs, they, they always say that, the price of fuel, um, you know, and that's why I think the price of fuel has to be taken into account. And that's why we'll see plug-in hybrids. If anything, they'll be the best balance going forward. Uh, I'm, like, I'm driving a Pacifica hybrid, which is really a plug-in. And, it, and I, to me, it's the best balance of everything in terms of, you know, you, you don't have to plug it in if you don't want to, but you know, it's, it's, a, it's, it's just the best of uh, an EV and a, a gas engine, you know, and, and I think that the going forward, that's gonna be, you know, there's been some bad plug-in hybrids, though. You know, let's not. 
Well, like you know, the last, still the last early. The Prius plug -in. coming out are pretty good. Yes, and they're very good. Well, so. I, I think <laughs> the issue for places like California is is they, I mean, they want zero emission vehicles, and your plug-in is not a zero emission vehicle. No. Therefore, you know, even though it is, from all practical purposes, the best way to go for most people, it, it still doesn't meet what they're looking for. But I mean, I just wonder if, I mean, okay, if, if you look, let's look at, let's look at manufacturing of an EV versus manufacturing of a conventional internal combustion engine vehicle, right? Much greater simplicity. I mean, as, as Sandy, Sandy Monroe, who knows more about manufacturing than, uh, you know, any three dozen people we know, I mean, is basically saying, hey, this really can be beneficial in terms of lowering those costs. So if you lower the battery costs and you lower the manufacturing costs and you're able to get batteries that have the sort of range that, you know, that bolt-like range, then perhaps you're going to have an apples-to-apples -apples comparison when you go to your new car lot and say, you know, do I want that, uh, that you know, but California, Lantra or do I? No, no, California I'm, is in a really unique position. They have a great climate for EVs. It's perfect. Right. You come here to Michigan, it's terrible in the winter to drive an EV. It's absolutely terrible. But if, I mean, but let's okay, so if, if, let's say you have 250 mile range in California. What is that going to go down to in, in Michigan in the winter? It's not going to go down to 150. 50. Hmm? 150. Right. But still, what I'm getting at is that if, if you're doing a business plan and you're trying to figure out, you know, what's the potential or, you know, what would you know, you can't say that the uh, market in California is going to be the same as other parts of the country for EVs because well, you can't say the market's the same for convertibles either. No, you can't. So and you've seen everybody get out of that. No, well, not everyone. Well, it's quickly becoming a very small market. But what's well, going to be different cars for different courses? And you're right. Yeah. You know, if you do a lot of driving in a day and you're in a cold climate, an EV's not gonna work for you. It no. just probably is I tried it, it doesn't work. And, and you know, and when you get into level three charging, my experience is it's more expensive than gasoline. It's not cheaper, it's, it's six bucks just to plug in. Mm -hmm. So those people who are gonna do a lot of driving and a lot of charging are gonna say, you know what, forget about it. Give me an internal combustion engine. But for many other people, the electric will just be fine, well, even with reduced range. Um, you know, I don't know if you know who Wayne Gerdes is, uh, you know, the hypermiler guy. Mm -hmm. uh, but his clean MPG website, he did an analysis back in January. He lives in San Diego, and um, it's actually more expensive to have to plug in a, to charge a leaf and drive it than it is because of the price of electricity there, than to drive a gasoline car. So it's a, it, I mean, there's some other challenges in place other than politics or the, you know, the cost of these vehicles or profitability or anything, the whole, you know, is it even cheaper to do it? I mean, is there savings for people? No, that, that's a good point because in different parts of the country, electricity can be a lot more expensive. And then there's peak times. I'm told in uh, LA peak time is uh, it's about 45 cents yeah. Uh, per kilowatt hour. That's more expensive than gasoline. Yes. Well, there could be some big changes coming there. I was reading a M McKinsey report this morning that there's going to be huge disruption in the overall electrical grid because of the ability to have localized energy storage. And so they're suggesting to energy companies that they begin to rethink what they do. So it could be that those prices are going to come way down. Could be. Could be. I mean, that, that's one of the things that uh, argues in favor of electric cars is, is that the utilities in the country are way overcapacitized for peak demand because peak demand drops so much at night. And so if you can use that unused capacity to store up electricity and batteries, now you've greatly increased your capacity without adding any production plants, any generating plants. So that could happen. All right, so, so moving on to normal cars. Uh, all right, finally. All right, so um, the used car market is, is an indicator of car sales overall. And it seems that uh, there are some that are saying that we're, we're beginning to see those sales go down and prices go down and others that are not so sure. Um, what do you think is going no, on? No, well, I, uh, others are saying the exact opposite. So KBB, Kelly Blue Book, has been saying that uh, prices of used cars have been falling and, in fact, fell last month. And then Mannheim just came out today and said, hey, no, that's not happening at all. In fact, 
dealers are buying up every used car they can possibly get their hands on and that prices actually went up last month and in fact they're they're up for the year the and, well the, i think part of the issue is you have to really separate what's the used market a bit crossovers trucks are hot correct sedans small cars are not so yeah i mean it, there there is a bloated inventory of cars especially you know, ones that are coming off a of lease or rental cars that are coming in and, and there's way more inventory. And there's also a lot of inventory for cars uh, that are, uh, you know, new cars. And I'm not talking about SUVs or crossovers or trucks. But so, you know, you can walk in, one of my neighbor bought an Impala, walked in, it was ten thousand dollars off. Screaming deal. Sales are dead in, in the water. A new, new car? Yes, or a, a new car. So, I mean, you also have, you know, you're to the point where new cars are sometimes competing with used cars because of the pricing. Um, so, yeah, it's, you know, but, you know, uh, I was looking at, you know, uh, cruise prices are, are still, they're, they're holding steady. I mean, they're like ten, eleven thousand dollars $11,000 at auction, which is great mm -hmm. for, you know, where they've been. So, you know, I, I mean, I think... Uh, yeah, it's a it's a case by case basis. Uh, I mean, we can look at macro numbers, but it's uh, a lot of it's going to be d dependent on the demand and um, and for small cars and sedans, it's really tough mm -hmm. right now. You know, one of the arguments for for why the prices were going up that they were saying is a lot of these are fairly new lease cars that have come in, and therefore they're just more expensive cars by their nature, well, and therefore you're able to get more for that. The Early used car new. market pricing has been, as many have said, artificially, almost artificially high for quite a while because there was a lack of supply. Mm -hmm. And as leasing has picked up, you know, from say three, two, three years ago, uh, when these vehicles are now coming in, there's a lot more inventory. So the prices should either hold steady or drop some in reality, you know, in, in theory they should, but reality is a different story. So, so. so do you see as more of these cars come in that the new car market is going to be depressed? Uh, no, because when people want new, they, they're not looking, it's, you're either a new person or a used person. So I'm, I'm really, I mean, yes, like my example, I mean, you could get a, a new car, you know, for, you can get a new Impala for $10,000 off or, you know, go, but it's not, uh, I don't think it's a really good comparison, but, mm -hmm. um, there, you know, and that's, I think, why you're seeing all this innovation going on in the used car market because, you know, you know the Carvana is the ones that are trying to do it online, CarMax growing, because they're seeing that this is a, this is a huge market, this restoration of used cars and, and then selling them, but sitting on the inventory and trying to, you know, yeah, you're buying all this inventory, but you could be sitting, if you buy too many sedans, you could be sitting on those, you know, used cars, sitting on your lot, watching them depreciate, uh, and uh, that's, that's an issue. If you, you know, you got too many Sonatas or Altimas or whatever out there, you could be losing money while they sit on your lot and you can't sell them. You could never have too many. <laughs> yeah. You know, what, one of the things that may be different between KVB and Mannheim is that Mannheim runs the auction. Yeah. I mean, their data is about as, as, as real immediate as, it gets. as yeah. you can get. And so I wonder if they're not a, a leading indicator of what's starting to happen in the market right yeah. now in the last month or two versus KBB, which may have more of a, a lag time in collecting its data. Yeah, I, I mean, it, it could be. I just, uh, I'm, I think, like I said, it's it's dependent on what people want, and we know what people want, and those are crossovers. So, I mean. Yeah, no, and, and that's what I, I think they both have said, yeah. to your point. The other thing that came out today that I found interesting was Experian, which is one of three major credit, credit tracking credit. companies in the United States, said there's no subprime bubble. You know, and that this this whole concern about subprime, it's over and done with. That as there were increasing delinquencies and more and more subprime buyers, that lenders earlier this year said, that's that, no more of this. And in fact, credit scores are up for both new and used cars. And that delinquencies, 30-day delinquencies, which is you know, when you're really in trouble, so that, are, are actually going down. That might in fact, be at, a, at like a 10-year low. That might be the case, but if you look at companies like Synchrony Financial, which they do a lot of, um, you know, uh, uh, store credit cards and other things, their stock dropped like a rock a couple weeks ago, and that was because that's the first thing people stop paying is, you know, your your gap card, 
you don't stop paying for your car. So they're kind of a leading indicator of where things can go. So you stop paying for that pair of jeans you bought a couple months ago, um, but you're not gonna stop paying for your car. So it, the writing is on the wall right now that we could go into something like that. When you start to see consumer goods not being paid, the credit cards are not being paid, uh, that's kind of a, hey, we need to watch out what's going on because the car you still need. Um, the jeans are not gonna come back and get uh, the car, man can yeah, there's no repo man coming to get your jeans off. Your so, jeans off. You need but, those jeans. But that's the kind of thing that we need to look at and that, um, you know, those are like, that's one of the signs that uh, things could go south. Mm -hmm. so, so Auto Pacific, you guys came out with your uh, 2017 Vehicle Satisfaction Award winners. The President's Award, the highest score to date, the yeah. Genesis G90. Yeah, at, uh, you know, I'll, I'll say that- Both buyers really like it. <laughs> <laughs> Look, um, we do not pick these ourselves, okay? Um, we do, uh, we, we field a survey uh, for the, from January every year to April of every year of people that purchased a car in October, November of December, okay? And uh, it takes about an hour to do this survey. Uh, we had over 50,000 respondents this year. Um, and these people are the ones that come up with this. I mean, they're the most satisfied. It's not a quality, it's not a perceived quality, it's not an initial quality, it's not anything like that, it's satisfaction. And um, you know, it, there's, there's some certain things you can look at when you look at that list of, of vehicles, vehicles that you know, have a big interior, they tend to score very well. Mm -hmm. um, I think the Versa is on there. Economy uh, card, Nissan Versa. Yeah, that, that's because it doesn't, when you get in, the interior is big. People like that. They perceive it as they're satisfied because they feel like they got more for their money. Same thing with Genesis. It's, it's a vehicle that, like, you know, seems to offer a lot of the same things as the luxury makes. It has significantly less money, great warranty, and, you know, people feel satisfied with that. They're, mm -hmm. it, uh, so it's not, I, I, you know, like I said, it's not something we pick. It's just a, uh, it, it's a highest satisfaction premium brand Lincoln. Oh, yep. You should have brought that up when Andrew was well, here. <laughs> but again, I mean, as I had mentioned earlier that, you know, the Lincoln, uh, you know, people are used to it being kind of a, a badge engineered Ford. It's not anymore. So if you're coming in and getting a Lincoln, another leasing, another Lincoln, chances are it doesn't look like whatever the Ford sibling is, and you know, it has, has some unique characteristics, so people feel more satisfied that they're getting a little bit more. In uh, fact, for a luxury SUV, Lincoln Navigator is, is The on. current generation. Yeah. 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 So, but, but again, you know, when I look at the, the, the Lincoln Navigator current gen, when I look at the, the Genesis G90, boy, they can't give those things away. Nope. Yeah. People may be satisfied with but them, you, but their but your, sales flops. Well, you can be, but you can be satisfied with it. Satisfied and, and sales flops don't, you know, you, you may have gotten a screaming deal and you feel like right. you're, uh, you're walking well, away with the winner. We had that 1540 number. That wasn't the number of uh, Genesis sold. <laughs> Calendar year to date, uh, 782. Whew. Yeah, I mean, that's what I mean. It's, it's nailed crossover. to the showroom floor. They need yeah. crossovers right. in the worst way. Yeah. They really do. They do. Did anything surprise you on that list? Um, luxury car, G90, aspirational luxury car, Volvo S60, V60, uh, luxury midsize car, S Maxima, large car, yeah. Kia, Kia Cadenza, that surprises me. Yeah. Midsize car, Kia Optima, premium compact car, which speaks to size, Mini Clubman, compact car, Honda Civic, economy car, Versa, sports car, 911. Sporty car, I like that. Sporty car, Dodge Challenger. Light, Again, it's light big. Okay, here's one. This this surprises me. Light duty pickup truck. Guess what it is? <laughs> Titan. <laughs> <laughs> See, I had to to choose the opposite of what I thought it should be. And you know, and I think that's it's just a uh, people perceive that they're going to get the short end of the stick when they get whatever, and they find out they're not, and they're more satisfied with it. Well, I always said that when Yugo was on sale, everybody knew it was a piece of crap. And when they bought one and realized it, it met their expectations. Yeah. So, I mean, these are basically exceeding people's expectations. Mm -hmm. mm, we got Ridgeline, Navigator, uh, Yukon XL, uh, mm -hmm. Grand Cherokee, midsize SUV. 
Porsche Cayenne. Well, of course, you're going to be satisfied with that. Uh, Lexus RX, Ford Flex. Again, big. Ford Flex. Yeah. People love that vehicle. The people yeah. that own it. I, There's I, not a whole I lot of them. Yeah, I was say. They love There's it. not a whole lot of them that buy it. I mean, right. sales so, are way down. But so, so why? Okay. Arguably, that vehicle has never taken off. No. Right. Why? Um, I think it is extremely polarizing. I, I mean, I can't get over it. Tell us what you really mean. I, I cannot stand the sides of it. I don't like that it looks the way it looks. I don't think people know what it is. Is it a wagon? Is it a crossover? Is it? They, it's just a. It, people couldn't identify what it was. And I think when you have a vehicle like that, whether it was the the old R Class, the Mercedes Benz R Class, uh, the Infiniti EX, which is now the QX50, people are like, "Is that a hatchback? Is it a? What, you tell me it's a crossover, but it's not. The C Max, uh, you know, it's not a crossover. It's not a hat. You know, what is it? You know, that's an interesting observation. The Bolt. Yeah. You, you know, that's another one for me. That you know, you tell me it's the size of a crossover but it doesn't have the attributes of a crossover so people are like uh, I don't know what that is you know it, it's an interesting observation that if people can't really identify they, they with a vehicle not identify what it is but identify with yeah. a vehicle if they can't put it into a segment but but the thing is and maybe that's part of what this list shows the people who are attracted to it love it mm -hmm. absolutely love it but their sales flops mm -hmm. You know, and that, that might be an interesting way to look at it. The more satisfied people are with the vehicle, probably the worse that sales are. No, it's and, and I'm. It's it's a weird way to look at it, but it's um, I think that's where you know, hey, I'm I'm looking for a pickup truck. I don't want what everybody else has. Yeah, I'm probably gonna miss out on some stuff. And then holy crap, I really like this. Or, you know, wow, this you know it, it somehow exceeds their what they, they thought they were gonna get. And um, like I said, these are still people who, these are people that, you know, they've only had it a few months when they've gotten it. So uh, it's still fresh, you know, and you know, Ford Flex, I mean, that that's a really, that's a really dated vehicle now. Very dated, might be the oldest vehicle on the road. Somebody should do a study on that, David Sullivan. Uh, yeah, I mean, there might be a journey. Whether it's journey is big... pretty old. That's another one that's yeah, pretty that's old. old. So. Yeah, no, that might point. be older. Yeah. yeah. You got anything else, Gary? Because we're getting down to the uh, very end. I think, I, I think I've exhausted this. Okay. So. Well, then we are down to the very end. All right. David Solomon, thanks for coming on again. Oh, thank you for having me. I You're really good. Love it. And Gary, good seeing you. Okay. And I uh, want to see all of you back here again next week. Auto Line After Hours is brought to you by Bridgestone Tires, your journey, our passion. And by Lear a global leader in automotive seating and electrical systems. Visit our website, Autoline.tv, where you can watch us live Thursday afternoons. Get your daily fix with Autoline Daily and in-depth analysis and interviews with Autoline This Week. There's all that and much more at Autoline.tv. Now the long wheelbase, it would have fit. Yeah, it fit. But this one, this one looks bigger than it is. No, I, I think that's pretty wild that they're doing two wheelbases. Well, they they still have, they have that now. Oh, I guess. Uh, they, yeah, they have it now. It's about? just um. Yeah, it's kind of you know it's Cadillac. It's well, the Cadillac same thing. Like Yukon, yep. Tahoe, they all ESV, it. Tahoe, Suburban, mm -hmm. you know, same thing. But uh, yeah, it's um, but the, we you know as like we talk about, I, I mean, I think what they sold around ten thousand Navigators or some somewhere around there. I, I was surprised because I I think. The current generation drives really well. Yeah, and you know they did that refresh a couple yeah. of years ago, and it didn't do anything. Yeah, I was. But I mean, you ten thousand, and then you're gonna have two body styles. I mean, that's mm -hmm. think of the complexity of that. That you know, two frames. You got four wheel drive, two wheel drive, different doors. I mean, glass, everything, mm -hmm. the wiring harnesses. For a low volume vehicle like that, it's it's really hard to make a business case, especially with aluminum. But do you think that? They'll sell more with this one. I do. I, do. I mean, because because I yeah, think it's, you're, you're right. I mean, so so it should lease better. Last year they did uh, ten thousand four hundred twenty-one. Ten thousand close. And uh, but then I, I look at at Escalade and they did uh, twenty-three oh. yeah. six for the regular Escalade and fifteen four eighty-eight for the ESV. So that's a yeah. combined. Uh, 
um, 38,000. The way you have to remember it too is you have to combine the volume of all of these vehicles. Right. So Tahoe, Suburban, and both of the Yukons because- And Silverado. Yeah, because that is because where- the, All the underpinning. Yeah. That's why they don't have an independent rear suspension. Yeah. It's right off the pickup. They, they have the purchasing power behind their SUVs and pickup trucks is massive. Even though, you know, Ram, whatever, mm -hmm. Ram outsold um, uh, Silverado last month, big deal. GM's got the purchasing power behind that to make more money per vehicle right. than anybody else. So, you know, and then, like I said, with the low volumes, it's hard to go to a supplier and say, well, you know, the supplier would be like, hey, you only made 10,000. How are you supposed to give you a good price on that? You only did 10,000. So, um, yeah, that's, that's, a, that's, a, that's a, it's a bold move to uh, do something like that. Look, that's what it's going to take. That, it, exactly. I mean, you got you to spend something to make some now. So. Right. And then, you know, China's going to help too. Yes. Um, those ones usually look pretty weird. They don't have tinted glass, weird seat belts, and some hmm. other stuff. So You look. know, Joe Philippi told me that he estimated Cadillac was making it about a $30,000 variable profit on the Escalade. I, so, and I, he said, and it could be even much higher than that, depending on the model you're talking about. So uh, that's what these guys at Lincoln are after. Yeah. You know, they, they're probably well, the, not. They had to because GM's going big with the next Escalade. So these guys had to big. go big. I mean, I mean, it's all out. I mean, this is, this, the next one's going to be, you know, it's, it's, they're, they're, they're batting a thousand here. So they want to they wanna keep where they're at. And uh, so, wow. so stay tuned. It's, uh, mm -hmm. it's going to be big. Okay. Well, we should. Uh, Probably detach. detach, right? Let the crew get to work here, getting the vehicle out. Oh, yeah. Oh, great. Cool. Forget to I, fold the mirrors in, or yeah. it's gonna go viral as. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's. Yeah. I, I, I wouldn't pick apart this vehicle uh -oh. at all. Oh, they fold it back out. Is, is it, will they automatically go in? They went in. That's gonna wrap it out. Sure does. Direction of the new navigator. Oh, I have a. I like that. I like that. 